Military affairs have always been affected by technological change. And over the past few centuries of the Industrial Revolution, there's been a great emphasis on advances in weapons. Uh, their range, their accuracy, the rapidity of, of fire, all of these things have mattered very greatly. They have culminated in recent decades in the phenomena called uh, shock and awe, uh, better known as the Powell Doctrine of Overwhelming Force. All of this has happened at the end of an industrial age that emphasized weaponry and at the beginning of an information age that is now going to emphasize information systems. And what we find is that this uh, new age of information-based conflict, and that is both in the technical terms of information systems as well as in the influence operations and the narratives and messages that we try to get across to achieve influence, uh, what we're finding is that overwhelming force means less and less and knowing means ever more. This search for uh, knowledge and information really falls into two areas. One of them has to do with the idea of knowing what's going on on the other side of the hill, as well as knowing what goes on with one's own forces. And we have systems today that allow a great deal of information to move very swiftly our problems, of course, are twofold. One is that we create an ocean of information that is hard to process, and that achieving command and control over widespread forces generating huge flows of information uh, is both uh, difficult and at the same time the technology may encourage efforts to over control. Now we'll find a balance one day between control and decontrol. We will learn to structure information as well as to process it. I'm very confident that we're going to achieve uh, the solutions to those mechanistic problems. The greater threat, I believe, arrives from holding the increasingly important information systems at risk. The disruption of information flows uh, may make a profound difference on the battlefields of the future. The battle spaces, it's not all on land, right? It's at sea, it's in the air, in space as well. The disruption of information systems can cripple a modern armed force. Indeed, everything that empowers armed forces in informational terms is the very same thing that imperils them by their disruption. And so information security, and I use that broader term than simply cybersecurity, is absolutely crucial. Now, where do things stand? Uh, not in a very good place. Uh, just in the summer of 2012, General Keith Alexander, the head of the Army uh, of the Cyber Command and uh, the National Security Agency at the Aspen Security Forum, noted that on a scale of 1 to 10, American cybersecurity is a 3. He followed this up by observing that an unparalleled theft of intellectual property was going on. And uh, this was bleeding out of American commercial firms. Uh, the Mandiant report recently suggested that China was behind this, but I'm sure they're not the only ones involved in this. So we have at a strategic level, as well as at an operational, even at tactical levels, a concern about cybersecurity. How are we to improve this situation? That is, I think, the central challenge for military affairs in our time. The very things that make us powerful make us vulnerable, and so the challenge is to figure out a way to retain that power that we get from good connectivity while at the same time uh, making the most informed use and keeping these systems as secure as we possibly can. How to do this? Well, I think we have a paradigm problem here. Just as 70-some years ago, French strategists decided that they wanted to secure their country from armored attack with a Maginot line. So today we're trying to secure our cybersphere with uh, Maginot lines. We call them firewalls for the most part. 
I'm afraid they are as vulnerable as Maginot lines. They, uh, the Maginot line was both outflanked and penetrated, and I'm afraid the same can happen to firewalls. They only recognize what they know. A good uh, hacker acquaintance of mine, one of the master hackers, likes to say there are no firewalls. They only recognize what they know. And he's absolutely right. And he and those of his ilk can simply walk through firewalls. And they do with regularity. So we need something other than that kind of perimeter defense. I think there are a couple of good suggested solutions here. And one is the ubiquitous use of strong encryption. Don't simply rely on the firewall to pr protect soft inviting targets on the other side of it. Uh, don't rely simply on honeypots to distract uh, the interloper. Instead, encrypt everything as strongly as you possibly can. I know this comes at a little bit of cost, effort, and time, but it's well worth it for the security gains. And this is not only important for military systems, it's also key for the protection of our nation's uh, commercial intellectual property, for the protection of our critical infrastructure. Right on down the line, strong encryption, while it doesn't solve every problem, uh, can greatly complicate the attacker's task. Something else in addition to strong encryption I would recommend would be the increasing use of what's called the cloud. Uh, that is the place outside your own systems where information can be put. And cloud singular is probably a misnomer. There are many clouds out there. The point is to have information outside your own system and do the thought experiment with me. Take a document, encrypt it with strong encryption, break it into five pieces, and then put it into five different places in the cloud. Now tell me who's going to go get that and exploit that. Whether you're a company protecting your intellectual property or the military protecting sensitive information, uh, this is, I think, a, a very, very important uh, possibility that needs to be pursued. So crypto and the cloud. May I add to this also the idea that we have to think in terms of the fog. Uh, the fog is outside your own immediate system, but on the edges of your own network. Just as fog is closer to the ground than uh, the clouds are, so the fog is closer to your system, but not quite on it. Uh, taking advantage of unused spaces in, in networks. Um, these are the ways we, we need to think about things. Uh, we don't simply want to have data sitting behind firewalls anymore. Data at rest is data at risk. If you leave it in a place, it will be penetrated. And so protection both against outside attack and against the treachery of trusted insiders, both of these problems will be well addressed, again, by the use of very strong encryption and off-planet, if you will, uh, off-system uh, storage spaces. The key, again, is mobility. Keep moving the information around, just as you change your passwords regularly. So these are simple ways in which cybersecurity can be improved. Why does this matter? It matters because the effectiveness of our forces in the field, at sea, in the air, in space, uh, all this is very much held at risk. Uh, by the insecurity of our systems. This period of technological change in military and security affairs is going to see the emphasis on information systems, just as much as the previous era saw the greatest emphasis on the weapons uh, systems. That's the great tectonic shift underway. Weapons don't go away, but the smarter those weapons are, the more intelligently they can be used, the less weaponry has to be deployed. The more you know, the less you need shock and awe. And so it poses the prospect of great economies of force in, in the future, in our, in our conflicts. It poses the prospect of fighting when we must with less destruction, perhaps more disruption. In many ways, mechanization and the blitzkrieg that came with it allowed the possibility of short, sharp campaigns, some of which we've seen not only in World War II, but in Israel's Six-Day War, in the Indo-Pakistani Wars, and in many other conflicts over the past 70 years. So the cyber wars to come may also be swift and decisive and far less destructive. That's the great prospect. Now how do we get there? We can only get there with the proper human capital. 
And it seems to me that the central challenge here is how to create both specialists with deep skills in the business of cyber warfare, cyber security, deep expertise, at the same time that we cultivate a more general appreciation of information age conflict across the entire officer corps. So we need both specific experts and generalists. And I think this is a very considerable challenge. Just as in the age of uh, Blitzkrieg, there were a handful of great panzer commanders who understood with depth and insight how to employ armor most skillfully, there was at the same time a growing sense among the officer corps of the need for these capabilities. The, the German military was never more than about 10% uh, panzer, uh, but these forces achieved many uh, great and stunning victories despite having just a thin layer of this kind of mechanization. Now this was because, in part, uh, their officer corps in general had a deep appreciation for the overall possibilities of maneuver warfare. Well, we may achieve the same today. We may never have more than a thin slice of the U.S. military expert in cyber matters, but their ideas will diffuse, inform, and guide others throughout the force. And I think that's an interesting uh, model that is uh, worth pursuing. Now, in order to get to that point, of course, we have to create a community of professionals whose expertise lies explicitly in the business of cyber warfare, cyber security, uh, cyber strategy. These are the people who will be the latter-day equivalents of the Heinz Guderians and Erwin Rommel's of the, and George Patton's of the uh, great age of mechanized maneuver warfare. It, it seems to me that that community must be created. Now in creating that community, I want to caution against the possibility that be, it becomes a closed circle, that it is something inward looking, uh, a dark art of cyber warfare that is held close. And the problem there is that if we create this level of expertise, but keep it within the closed circle of a small community, it will never diffuse to the whole force. And make no mistake, the real goal here is full transformation, a whole new way of looking at warfare. So yes, we want to create a community of professionals with deep and specific expertise, but at the same time, the charge to that community is that it must reach out to all. It must communicate with the entire officer corps across the services. This new sensibility must emerge if we are to actualize the potential of these forces. Now I tend to follow other militaries a little bit uh, because I'm interested in one of the courses I teach is called uh, Military Organizations and Technological Change. And it's a pretty sad seminar when you think about it as the industrial age is one to which most militaries were slow to respond Many did not respond correctly. Many held to stubborn old ways. Think of the Western Front in World War I a hundred years ago. Many held to old ways for far, far too long, at far too great a cost. So what I think we have to do is see this as yet another era in which a military is called upon to respond to the strategic, organizational, and doctrinal implications of technological change. That's how we have to pose this. Cyber professionals are not a narrow guild. They are the emissaries of a new way of war. And they are the ones who, with their deep understanding, must learn to share it usefully across the general military professional community. And what I see when I look at foreign militaries is that some of this is already going on. If one looks at the Russian military today, you will find both the specialist and the generalist now thinking in terms of what is enabled by what some of us call information dominance. I first used that phrase in an article in Strategic Review back in the summer of 1994. I'm uh, pleased to see that nearly 20 years later, uh, the term information dominance is now gaining a little bit of uh, cachet. Well, the point is that in the Russian military, they seek this information dominance by any and all uh, means. They do have professionals with deep skills, but they have an officer corps increasingly attuned to the need to achieve an information advantage 
in battle. And I would urge all to look closely at the events of 2008 in the Russo-Georgian War, a conflict in which uh, Georgians, uh, armed, equipped, and, and trained with uh, many American information security systems, uh, saw all of them uh, overtaken, disrupted, exploited in a very short period of time and they saw their military effectiveness, even, even though they were not going to do tremendously well given the size disparity between Russia and Georgia. Their ability to defend at all was fatally compromised from the outset. And so it seems to me that we see in the case of the Russians already uh, a very, very deep understanding of the connection between an information edge and victory in battle. Now our Chinese friends uh, have demonstrated, I think, already a capacity for the strategic use of cyber weapons. And the American military, charged with protecting our country, has to get a sense of how to defend against this. A new strategic defense initiative has to be created, and that is something, too, that the cyber professionals are going to have to spearhead. We will not see the private sector solve this problem because market forces drive us towards swift, cheap, attractive products, but not secure ones. The politics of the situation is that concerns over privacy are going to mean there will be little legislation created that will enforce good security standards. So the challenge is a very steep one for this community. How do we secure, defend strategically our society in the face and it's an open society full of rich, inviting targets. How do we protect that against an opponent clearly already using it strategically for intelligence and the extraction of intellectual property? How do we deal with the possibility that all of our critical strategic systems have been mapped or are in the process of being mapped and that they will be attacked in the case of, uh, of a larger war? Uh, that is a problem set to which I think the cyber professional community must turn its minds, its very best minds, uh, immediately. And it must share with the Department of Homeland Security, with law enforcement throughout the interagency community, but also across the services, and realize that a new kind of strategic defense is absolutely essential. So I say all this with a sense of the great challenges that lie ahead. I say it at a time when the cyber professional community is just now getting on its feet. I say it at a time when the cyber command itself has only about a thousand people uh, in it. The challenge is uh, quite, quite substantial. Uh, I am uh, confident, though, knowing many who are in that community, knowing their senior leaders, I'm very confident that we will meet and master this challenge. I hope those of you who are going to be a part of this community, or already are, will turn your minds both to the battlefield problems as well as to strategic defense. Offense, too, of course. We won't say too much more about that. But I hope also that you will recognize the need to reach out to the overall American military, your colleagues, your senior leaders, to the commander-in-chief, Unless we achieve that broader understanding, we will never gain, we will never gain the dividends that are possible for moving into this new era of conflict. Every technology creates its own sociology, though a community of cyber professionals is one of those social responses to the new technology. And that social response going to be absolutely crucial to our ability to move forward, to secure our country, our world, to deal with the range of threats, from terror networks to rogue nations. The task is daunting. It will take time and dedication. Uh, let me urge us all to move forward. Onward. Thank you.